It is a sin to waste the time and energy God has given to us. And the first thing we have to address is whether it makes any sense at all when the church is facing such a great crisis as it is in the year 2022 to speak about the rhythm of Gregorian chant. I can imagine someone saying the church has so many problems right now, so many scandals, heresy is being taught, and so forth and so forth. And they could say, why are we even talking about the rhythm of Cantus Gregorianus? Why are we fighting about the rhythm? Um, they might say, you know, what a waste of time to make a video about the rhythm of Gregorian chant at this time. And. I don't say that this video is perfect by any stretch of the imagination. This is a talk that I gave during the symposium, the Sacred Music Symposium in the year 2022. I don't claim that it's a perfect talk, but I would merely point out that during World War II, many of the monks of the Abbey of Salem had to go and fight Hitler. As a matter of fact, many of them, more than, well, approximately 20 of them were held as prisoners of war by the Germans. Many of them died, obviously, and these were not monks that were not important. Uh, the, for example, one of the prisoners of war was the prior of the abbey. Another prisoner of war was the sub-prior of the abbey. Another prisoner of war was the organist, Dom Bonnet. And can you imagine joining a monastery and then having to go fight a war? Uh, but, but even during that time, the monks continued to try to restore the authentic sacred music of the church, and I think we can learn something from that. That was uh, the World War II was certainly not the only trial that that they had. For example, the monastery of Salem was banished from their country. They were not allowed to be in their country, which was France, for 15 years because of the anti-clerical laws of France. So they, they had to go and take refuge in England for 15 years. Imagine that. Uh, a young child that's five years old would have been 20 years old by the time they returned. And Abbot Potier, uh, who had been a monk at Salem, but then became the abbot of a different uh, monastery, San Wandri, was also forced to leave because, as I mentioned, because of the anti-clerical laws of France, all the religious had to leave. And he took his monks to take refuge in Belgium. And we might speak of that later in the talk because there kind of develops almost a kind of an English-French school, in a, in a manner of speaking, and kind of a Belgium-Germany school. And I, in, the, in the depths of my heart, I can't wonder whether that might have something to do with the fact that Dom Potier went to Belgium with his monks and Dom Mokoro went to England with his. And, and that's not an important point. I just, I mentioned that uh, because most people don't realize that the religious were all banished from their own country. And isn't it interesting that after the, the country of France banished them, then they still went and fought for France against the Germans. And as I mentioned, many of them were captured and so forth and died. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, in spite of all those difficulties that they had at that time, they still tried to promote genuine, authentic, sacred music. And it seems to me that in spite of the crisis of the church, the very serious crisis of the church, the restoration of Cantus Gregorianus still matters greatly. It's important to realize that when we sing Gregorian chant according to the official rhythm, we are singing, broadly speaking, in the same style as Catholics have done for centuries. This is one reason I suggest that methods based on speculation and guesswork should not be promoted. Let me see if I can give an example of what I'm talking about. If you look at the screen, uh, you see a, a medieval manuscript. And let me show you how it goes. I'm not saying it's perfect, but this is something, something that it sounds kind of like. Laudate Dominum Omnes Gentes Something like that. I'm not saying it's perfect. But then if you look at the Editio Vaticana, produced by Abbot Potier under Pope Pius X, you see you have almost like the exact same thing. Laudate Dominum 
omnes gentes. And so it's important for us to realize that we are singing, broadly speaking, generally speaking, the same way that Catholics have sung for many centuries. Now, certain things are not open to debate. For example, we have, what would you even call it? We have a, a trail, if you will, <laughs> like the Oregon Trail. Uh, we, have a, we have an incontrovertible trail, note by note, that goes back basically 1,800 years, 1,900 years, excuse me, about 1,300 years. And this trail is not open to debate. There is no debate about what this trail is and what it means. It's absolutely remarkable. Mnemonic device, by the way, you have to understand what that is. Uh, it's something that helps you remember something. For example, when we go to Mass, we remember TARP. T-A-R-P. That is what we remember when we go to Mass. TARP. T-A-R-P. It's a mnemonic device. It stands for Thanksgiving, Adoration, Reparation, and Petition. But what you need to understand about a mnemonic device is it's of no use if you don't know what it stands for. If you go to Mass and you don't know what TARP stands for, then you might think that you need to have a big tarp or a tent over where you're going to mass. But no, tarp is a mnemonic device. It stands for something. And before they could write down music in the, in the early centuries, they had these mnemonic devices, which reminded them of the melodies uh, because of the squiggles, if you will, the adiastomatic notation. And it, it, was, it was only good for people who knew the melodies by heart. But then, of course, we have the diastomatic notation, which then placed it uh, on staves and so forth, above lines and so forth, so that there was no longer any doubt. Even if they didn't know the melody by heart, once the diastomatic notation came in, they could sing it off of the notes and lines. And so there's no question when you look at, and I've, I've, I've given some examples here of, you know, Gregorian chant going from 2012 all the way back to 877 AD, and we see that you can trace note by note all the way back. And it's a remarkable thing that the monks in those days, uh, we're talking 9th century, 7th century, 8th century, etc., had the entire graduale, vesperale, uh, processionale, they had all of the chants memorized. We're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of chant. And they had it all by memory. And, and what's even more remarkable, of course, is a lot of the melodies sound similar and there's nothing as hard as memorizing things which are similar yet not identical and so it's not open to debate that the gregorian chant as we generally speaking as we have it now goes back approximately 1200 1300 years it's absolutely remarkable what you see now on the screen are some of the manuscripts i've been looking at um, I've been engaged in a project in which I've been looking at manuscripts for about two years. I mean, I've been looking at manuscripts for about 20 years, but over these last two years, a particular project that I've been involved with has demanded that I look at manuscripts constantly, constantly for about two years. And on the screen, I put some of the manuscripts that, that I've been looking at and examining for this project. What I would, must say at this point is that I'm very skeptical of the meaning which certain people who call themselves semiologists assign to a diastematic notation as well as some of the Romanian letters. I'm very skeptical about that. Now, what are the Romanian letters? Um, basically, in two ancient manuscripts, maybe from the 8th century, 9th century, we don't know for sure, an explanation is found, okay? And some believe that this explanation was written from Rome, supposedly by a singer named Romulus, that's why they call it Romanian letters, to the monastery of St. Gaul. Now, exactly what the little letters mean, when this explanation was sent, to whom this explanation was sent, and to which manuscripts it applies is not known. Uh, but scholars like to speculate and guess. So, in essence, when I say I'm skeptical, basically I mean that when someone claims that a particular note of plain song is long or short, elongated or shortened, etc., ask them this question. How do you know that? How do you know to lengthen this or shorten this or 
whatever the case may be. And it is not enough to simply respond, well, because Dom Cardin says so. That is not sufficient in light of, at least for people who have looked at, at, at manuscripts, that's, that's an insufficient an answer to simply say, well, Dom Cardin says so. I could give you tons of examples of why I'm skeptical, but for the moment, let's just consider one. A uh, famous uh, semiologist recently gave a presentation, which can be downloaded off the World Wide Web. And this person makes the claim that a certain symbol, and here's a quote, sometimes indicates a lengthening and sometimes indicates a shortening. So we have a semiologist who says that a particular symbol sometimes indicates a lengthening and sometimes indicates a shortening. Now, this semiologist gives no evidence or explanation for why he believes this, but does that symbol sound like a very useful symbol to you? A symbol that allegedly, supposedly, sometimes means lengthen and sometimes means shorten? So we, we, could, we could spend a lot of time on this. I just, I, I'm very skeptical when someone says, oh, this, is, this means this, and just ask them, well, how do you know? How do you know that? Now we come to what I call the Lithuanian example, okay? In essence, semiologists tend to favor the cleanest manuscripts, which are the most accessible, as well as those which were easily available at the time. And they declare these manuscripts to be the best. Now, the problem, of course, is that just because a manuscript is clean doesn't de facto mean it's the most important or the best. That's almost like saying a book on your shelf is better than some other book because you can reach it without getting a ladder, okay? Which, of course, is nonsense. You know, if you're comparing books, I don't know, if you're comparing Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky to Moby Dick, you can't just say, well, this, is a, this book is better because I can reach it without getting a ladder. That, 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 that's, that's an unacceptable reason for saying that a manuscript is better than another manuscript. Um, and I call it the Lithuanian example because a lot of semiologists and people who follow Dom Cardin and others, they'll say all the time, they'll say, well, the manuscripts say this, or the manuscripts say that, or the manuscripts agree here, okay? And the reality is that's like saying, imagine if I came to you and I said, I know all of the languages in Europe. I speak them all. I'm completely fluent in all of them. But imagine if, as a matter of fact, I was only fluent in Lithuanian, which is only one of the languages spoken in Europe. Uh, does that make any sense to you if I kept repeating over and over again, oh, I speak all, the, I speak all of the languages in Europe? Wouldn't, wouldn't you eventually say, well, you, you don't speak French, you don't speak German, you don't speak Italian. I mean, wouldn't you eventually say, stop saying that you speak all the languages in Europe, you only speak Lithuanian? And, and that's what we're talking about here is when semiologists are always saying, well, the manuscripts say this or the manuscripts say that. As a matter of fact, they're not talking about all the manuscripts. They're usually only talking about one or two, possibly more, but usually just one or two manuscripts, which, by the way, often contradict one another. And it's, it's understandable why they do this because certain manuscripts, and I put one on the screen, are very beautiful and very clean and very easy to read and very easy to access. And so the temptation for the semiologist is to say, well, this is very clean, it's very beautiful, and it's very easy to read, therefore it's the most important and the others don't count. We can toss out the other 10,000 because this manuscript is clean and it's complete and it's accessible and look at how beautiful it is. Now, I don't dispute that this is a gorgeous manuscript and it's very clean. But, but that does not mean that it's the most important manuscript. At this time, let's go ahead and tackle the heart of the matter regarding so-called semiology or semiological rhythm or Dom Cardin rhythm, whatever you want to call it. Let's, let's go ahead and tackle the heart of the matter, okay? And here it is. If these symbols mean what the semiologists claim, as opposed to what I believe they mean, I, I believe that they were subtle nuances for a particular monastery at a particular time, okay? But, but let's just say, let's just assume that these symbols mean what the semiologists claim. Why does not one of the 10,000 manuscripts which came later reproduce 
any of those symbols, even accidentally. For example, if there's a long note, why don't, in, in, in all of those 10,000 manuscripts, why is not one, why does not one accidentally make a long note, for example? On the screen is, is the famous Montpellier H159, which is a very important and very ancient manuscript. Why did not a single one of the Episemata ever become a long note, even by accident? That, that's a very, very difficult question for the semiologist to answer, and I'm willing to be convinced, but I've not heard or read anyone try to answer that, okay? Now, we are told, we are told, well, the, diast the diastematic notation reproduced the pitches with 100% accuracy, but they completely messed up the rhythm. So in other words, we're told it was mass hallucination. And by the way, psychologists and, and people who study these types of things, there's no such thing as mass hallucination. But we're told it was, it was mass hallucination, okay? They all forgot. They all forgot about the lengthenings and the shortenings and all that. They got, they got the, the, the pitches 100% right, but they forgot the rhythm and they messed up the rhythm 100%. And, and that is the heart of the matter, okay? To say that the diastematic notation that came a little bit later, although some of it, as a matter of fact, was contemporary with it, by the way. Uh, Sangal, in particular, continued to use a diastematic notation for a long time, even after diastematic notation was invented. But, but the point is, we are told that they reproduced the notes with 100% accuracy, yet somehow, 100% of the diastematic notation manuscripts forgot to reproduce the true rhythm. Even by accident, they didn't do it. And, and that's, that's the question. Does that make sense to you? Does that make sense to you? That is the question. And now we move on to Jenny the Vanishing Elephant, okay? Jenny the, Val Jenny, excuse me, Jenny the Vanishing Elephant was a, a, a magic trick by Harry Houdini in uh, January of 1918, okay? He, you know, Harry Houdini was a magician and he did this he did this magic trick called Jenny the Vanishing Elephant, okay? And this actually is related to what we're talking about because Dom Cardin, who's kind of the leader, if you will, of the semiologists, Dom Cardin claims, and this is a quote, okay? He says, the interpretive peculiarities, that's his words, and the finesse of the notation, again, his words. He says, the interpretive particularities and the finesse of the notation disappeared. That's his word, disappeared. That's Dom Cardin's word, disappeared. Just like Jenny the Vanishing Elephant, it just, they just disappeared. So I guess we're supposed to be smarter than the 10,000 manuscripts that came slightly afterwards and magically suffered mass hallucination about the rhythm, but not about the notes, but only about the rhythm. That's, that's what we're told to believe. This is very important. I'll read it one more time. Dom Cardin on page eight claims, that the interpretive peculiarities and the finesse of the notation disappeared. He's basically saying the rhythm was forgotten or the, the true rhythm, if you will, disappeared or was forgotten. Now, as I've already showed you several times and as we're looking at the screen next to the elephant, you can see that the vast majority of manuscripts simply do not match what semiologists, and in this particular case, Dom Mokoro as well, claim to be the authentic rhythm. Even by accident, they don't match. Uh, I put some on the screen here. Very important manuscripts. All of them are very important manuscripts. Uh, I didn't even put Montpellier H159 on the screen because I couldn't fit it on the screen, but that's also a very important early manuscript, and that also does not have an elongation. We're talking about the, the yellow, uh, the highlighted yellow of Sangal 359, and we're talking about the fact that it's not reproduced in the other manuscripts. Again, I could have put a bunch more, but... This, uh, this is all that will fit on the screen, okay? And these are all very important manuscripts, by the way. So again, it's a case of the vanishing elephant. In my talk about the true rhythm of the Editio Vaticana, I mentioned that everything I said was fact. And that's, of course, different than the talk I'm giving now, because in this talk I'm speaking a little bit about speculation and my take on things and my view of things, etc., etc. So I'm not telling you just the facts. They used to say that in dragnet just the facts ma'am and so let's talk just just a little bit 
let's talk just a little bit about the transmission of music, okay? I've, I've mentioned that, if, in my perspective, those early symbols were probably slight nuances for individual singers. Uh, because so few of the manuscripts have them, and the manuscripts that do have them often contradict each other. And it's, you know, these, a, lot, a lot of times those pieces were sung by one singer or two singers. And the reality is, if the singer sang something too fast or too slow, the abbot may have told them, hey, sing that part faster next time. So they put a little symbol in there that means sing it faster. They were probably, in my view, they were probably very slight nuances, possibly even for individual singers, okay? And when we talk about the transmission of music on the page, well, I, as you can see, I put a little quote for you. Uh, let me read it really quickly. Joseph Hoffman was the greatest pianist who ever lived. Um, Anton Rubinstein was considered the second greatest pianist after Franz Liszt. Um, and um, I won't go into all that, but basically, Anton Rubinstein hated, hated child prodigies. And, and yet he took the little Hoffman because Hoffman was just so skilled. Um, and so Hoffman was talking about the way that Rubin, Rubinstein taught him. Anton Rubinstein often said to me, just play first exactly what is written. If you have done full justice to it and then still feel like adding or changing anything, why do so? And then Hoffman says, mind well after you have done full justice to what is written. How few are those who fulfill this duty? I venture to prove to anyone who will play for me, if he be at all worth listening to, that he does not play more than is written, as he may think, but in fact a good deal less than the printed page reveals. And this is one of the principal causes of misunderstanding the esoteric portion, the inherent style of a piece. A misunderstanding which is not always confined to amateurs. Inexact reading. The true interpretation of a piece of music results from a correct understanding of it, and this, in turn, depends solely upon scrupulously exact reading. Now, I read that to you again, not uh, as a just the facts, ma'am, thing, but as a, as a reflection on what it means to transmit music on a page, okay? There's a person who runs a big piano page, and it's, it's absolutely the most ridiculous thing I've ever read before, because he, he, he says the same thing about every pianist, even if it's 100 or 200 or 300 pianists, he says the same thing about all of them, and I'll give you an actual quote from this, from this person, okay? This is an actual quote. He says, this pianist plays with a gorgeous tonal palette, elegant but boldly shaped phrasing, refined dynamic levels, sumptuous timing, robust tone, burnished lines, dazzling fingerwork, utterly beguiling pedaling, rhythmic buoyancy, and poised voicing. So the question, of course, for those of us who have spent our entire lives studying piano interpretation, is what does any of that mean? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's robust tone, burnished lines, dazzling finger work. I mean, what does any of that mean in reality? And here's another quote, but this one has to do with Cantus Gregorianus, which is the subject of our talk, Gregorian chant, plain song. So when you sing some plain song, you may think that you're singing a phrase, and this is a quote, with a concise yet intense gesture underlining the tonal center by articulation while proceeding lightly with broad impulses emphasizing the oral function and all the while taking into consideration the melodic context. But could anyone who hears you singing, even one person in 10 million, vocalize what you say you're doing? Okay? That's, that's what I'm getting at. So again, if you sing some plain song, and this is an actual quote from a semiologist, and you think that, that when you're singing, you're singing a phrase with, quote, a concise yet intense gesture underlining the tonal center by articulation while proceeding lightly with broad impulses, emphasizing the oral function, and all the while taking into consideration the melodic context, end quote. Okay, maybe you think that you're doing that, but as I've already asked, would any of the listeners be able to say, wow, did you hear how he sang with that concise yet intense gesture and he underlined the tonal center by articulation, but then he proceeded lightly with broad impulses, emphasizing the oral function. And, and did you notice how all the while he took into consideration the melodic context? 
this is this is what we're talking about here when when you try to talk about you know nuances and and, and conveying nuances and stuff there's a famous story about toscanini toscanini once said of the first movement of beethoven's third symphony the heroic symphony also the known as the eroica toscanini said some say this is napoleon some say hitler some mussolini for me it is simply allegro con brio that i think is what i'm trying to get at here okay and it goes without saying that no medieval theorist ever wrote about dom cardine's elasticity of durational value or daniel soulnier's melodic elevation of the tonic accent no medieval theorist ever wrote those words we're, we're expected to you know take it on faith basically okay so why am I so skeptical? Why can't I just accept what Don Cardin says or any of these other people? Well, perhaps it's because my entire life I've studied the recordings of the various representatives of teachers such as Anton Rubinstein, Franz Liszt, and Theodore Leszczynski. And these students of the same masters could not sound more different. In essence, you had three important teachers of the 19th century, Rubinstein, Franz Liszt, Theodore Leszczynski. And you listen to their students. Rachmaninoff, Hoffman, Horowitz, Levine, Friedman, Tigerman, Brelovsky, Schnabel, etc., etc. And they're playing, when they play the same pieces, it couldn't be more different. Even people who studied with the same teacher. Now, if such different approaches to the same piece of music are a reality, and we're only talking about 20 to 30 years, by the way, we're only talking about 20 or 30 years worth of music, for example, Hoffman and Rachmaninoff and Levine were all born around the same year. And if those different approaches are a reality, should we not be skeptical when someone like Don Cardin insists that an unknown monk a thousand years ago would have sung a particular phrase with, quote, elasticity of durational value. Moreover, even if we accept Don Cardin's speculation, what does that have to do with the official edition? Which is a cento based upon hundreds of manuscripts. Let me say this very clearly. The official edition is not based upon an individual manuscript, an individual monastery, or an individual time period. At the end of the day, my friends, music is music. At the end of the day, music is not speech. Speech is speech. And music is music. Music is ultimately not a way to, quote, clarify or, quote, elevate speech. Because if that were the case, you could simply have someone like James Earl Jones read the texts, you know, into a microphone at church. That's never been the tradition of the church. That's never been the tradition of the church. Now, I put something on the screen. You're free to read it or not read it if you wish. Uh, I don't reveal the names here. It's, there's no point in that. But this is a person who um, considers himself a very um, learned uh, uh, semiologist. And, and, and this person studied with uh, someone named Father Columba Kelly and so forth. And you can read it if you want to. The point is that this person, to support his views on semiology, he reveals a tendency. He reveals a tendency that I've often encountered, okay? He tries to go back and change the word aperis to aperis, which is wrong, by the way. And if you show this to a Latin scholar, their head will explode, okay? That's extremely wrong. And this person says that because he says that gaudete came from a combination of gaude and te, which also, by the way, doesn't mean make any sense at all because is singular but long story short this person is trying to change latin which is like four thousand or five thousand years old latin is a very old language it's literally like four thousand or five thousand years old and they're trying to change latin so that it fits their semiology perspective and that is a tendency which we see again and again now daniel soulnier he's not dom daniel soulnier he was at one point but for many years he's he left the monastery he's not dom he's just daniel mr daniel soulnier um i'm not crossing him out as a person i just put that there so that because people often refer to him as dom he's not dom because he left the monastery perhaps 10 years ago or something like that the, the point is is that uh he was in charge of the palio 
for, for a while when he was a monk. He was in charge of the Palio. And he says here, this is ex his exact quote, I have to read it. The Romano-Frankish chant shows an entirely new concern for the construction of phrases. The melodic curve in the form of an arc. A concern that becomes a canon of composition for the Gregorian. This same holds true for the treatment of words. In the case of both the phrase and the word, the Latin accent is handled in the composition by a melodic elevation. Grammar has regained all its prerogatives over the music and find itself elevated as the custos recte loquendi. Now, let's talk about this. Daniel Soulnier has made a bunch of mistakes here, okay? First of all, we don't see a new concern in the so-called Romano-Frankish chant, okay? Uh, but but more importantly, we, we certainly don't see what he calls, what is it here? He says, melodic elevation, the Latin accent. That's just not there, okay? And there's 50 million examples you could pull out of the repertoire where you see that this notion of, and people have been trying to prove this for years, and it, it's still wrong. There is no melodic elevation of the Latin accent. Look at the first example I just put there. Uh, the word is etenim. Etenim. Look at how that, that is treated there. Is that the melodic elevation which the Romano-Frankish chant discovered? No. The word abitat, same thing. Uh, the words latitudinem or quoniam, the same things. The words tradidit and percutientes, the same thing. The word quam diu. This is not, this, this idea that, that the, um, the, the plain song treats the Latin accent the same way that Baroque composers do is wrong. It's just wrong. We have a slight digression here, and I apologize for this, and some of you may want to skip this slide, and, and that's, that's totally fine, but I just feel that I have to, I feel obligated to let you know that the unity of repertoire means that beyond a shadow of a doubt, it was not invented in the Carolingian period. We're talking about manuscripts from all over that, that match to the note, to the note, thousands of pages that match one another. This is long before music could even be written down with accuracy, and yet they match one another. There is no sane person could ever say that, you know, um, the, these are different chants. They, they match to the note. And so this unity, that's what's so important about these manuscripts is the unity, they match one another, okay? And that shows that, that this could not have been invented in the Carolingian era. It shows that these, these songs must have gone back much earlier um, than, than when they started to be written down. And, and this, is, this is where we go into a slight digression. Charlemagne began his rule in 768 AD and continued expanding his empire until his death in 1814 AD. His rule and that of his family brought great stability as a consequence of his vast conquests, he was recognized as the first Western emperor to rule since the fall of the Roman Empire three centuries earlier. Charlemagne was a great promoter of learning, and he summoned to his court important scholars such as Paul the Deacon from Monte Cassino, Alcuin of York from England, and Abbot Einhardt from the German-speaking section of the Frankish kingdom. Charlemagne attempted to learn how to write, even practicing the formation of letters in bed in old age. But he never succeeded, and whether he could read is not known. Now, let's talk about this stability, okay? It is incorrect to assert, as some irresponsible scholars have, that the Carolingian era created or invented the repertoire of plain song. A more accurate statement is that, owing to the stability Charlemagne and his family provided, manuscripts produced in the Carolingian era had a better chance to survive. Incidentally, this is not just the case with liturgical manuscripts. The Carolingian era witnessed a movement to write down, in other words, preserve knowledge, whether medicinal, botanical, geographical, astronomical, theological, liturgical, etc. One of the wonders of the world 
is the way that Catholic musicians carefully preserved thousands of ancient chants by means of an adiastomatic notation which had no value whatsoever unless the scribe or the singer already had the melody fully memorized. Now, let's talk about what we cannot know. What we cannot know. A serious error made by more than one scholar is to assume that if a particular manuscript is found in a particular location, that means it was created there a millennium earlier. In reality, we may never know where many liturgical manuscripts originated. Many things might occur over a millennium. Wars take place, cities are destroyed, buildings catch fire, old monasteries die out, new monasteries arise, and so forth. Scholars, of course, will never stop producing conjecture as to where a particular manuscript may have been created. Sometimes scholars examine local feasts, basing a hypothesis on those. Others attempt to identify which king might be depicted in the illustrations, and then, based on that, they try to guess whether the manuscript might have been created during his reign. A sensible person recognizes the limitations of such speculation. Moreover, the difficulties are multiplied when we realize that many manuscripts consist of several books which were combined at a later date. Furthermore, manuscripts from this era could require decades and several lifetimes to complete. So that's what we can't know, but we'll, here's what we can know. And I touched on this just, just earlier, I touched on this, okay? The reason ancient Catholic manuscripts possess such tremendous value is because they correspond to one another. Even today, scholars cannot begin to explain the astonishing correlation between manuscripts. And all this was done in an age before telephones, radio, automobiles, trains, or airplanes. When it comes to the antiquity of manuscripts, that is to say, in which century they were created, scholars have attained a fair amount of success thanks to the science of paleography, which can assign a date with reasonable certitude based on comparison of handwriting. So this, anytime I'm quoting manuscripts in this talk, or anytime anyone quotes these manuscripts, uh, they're approximations based, as I already said, on a variety of guesses. Um, as I mentioned, oftentimes if it has a particular feast in it, they say, well, maybe that was from this country or this monastery, or if it has a, as I mentioned, the, the illustrations can sometimes give you a clue, the handwriting can sometimes give you a clue, and so forth. Now, we have mentioned the Palio, which was this amazing um, production, basically, of the Abbey of Salem. Um, they, they collected a bunch of manuscripts, and they also published a bunch of manuscripts, and some of the manuscripts that they published are only available because they published them. In other words, the, the original manuscripts were destroyed in World War II because of the firebombing and other things like that. So the Palio is incredibly useful, okay? And we remember also that Dom Potier was originally a monk of Salem, and he did all of his work with chant as a monk of Salem, and then later on he went to found another daughter house, and after that he became an abbot of another Benedictine monastery. Although his brother, Alphonse Potier, I believe remained at, at Salem, and we, there are some letters uh, that someone should translate between Dom Potier and his brother, who, who remained at Salem. But when Potier was still at Salem, he opposed the publication. He opposed the Palio. He said, yes, at first sight, this project seems very seductive and full of promise. However, the closer you look at it, the sorrier the result will be. It could ruin the Gregorian restoration we are attempting at Salem. And, 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 and mark this part here. Potier said, we will see a harvest of the most extravagant theories on its origin, on the reading of neumes, on rhythm, and the modes of the Gregorian melodies, etc. So this is what I want you to understand. Dom Potier was afraid that the manuscripts would be misread and misinterpreted when placed in the hands of the general public. He was right. He has been vindicated. Let's listen to a short excerpt, a very short excerpt from someone named Bruno. And I call him Bruno the Moslem singer because if you look up his videos online, he tries to sing Gregorian chant kind of like the Moslems do. 
um, because he believes he believes that you know the Muslim religion is very ancient, and and the the, the Islamic religion is very ancient, but he seems not to realize that in fact the Christian religion is more ancient than Islam. And as a matter of fact, the Christian religion goes back further than Islam, and and the music that we have actually seems to have come from the Jewish temple. But in any event, he thinks that Muslim singing is old, so that's what he tries to do when he sings Gregorian chant. Wow. Eh ben, les manuscrits ont mis au jour que la note la plus haute de ce motif, c'est-à-dire un la, et porte la plupart du temps, ou quasiment tout le temps, une virga épisémée, c'est-à-dire un peu allongée. Donc, au lieu d'avoir Deus, eh ben, on a Deus. Ce qui, en plus d'être légitimé par les nœuds, est aussi une façon plus dynamique de faire entendre le mot Deus, puisque c'est ça l'objectif. Désormais, c'est leur pratique qui peut être dite arbitraire, issue d'une pratique qui a une centaine d'années environ, alors que le motif avec la virga épisémée sur le la, lui, il a au moins mille ans. So Bruno says the top note of Deus should be made longer, those are his words, should be made longer, according to the manuscripts. And notice how Bruno says the manuscripts. Now I have looked at the manuscripts, I've spent years looking at the manuscripts. The manuscripts don't agree with Bruno. And we can look at that even just by these, here are some examples that are on your screen, okay? By the way, one of, if you look at the bottom, you see that Abbot Potier copied that particular manuscript in 1868. Potier copied a lot of manuscripts by hand, which is astounding. That, that someone can go in and just copy entire manuscripts by hand. Unbelievable that he did that. Um, and really nobody should be allowed to criticize Potier in, unless they've copied at least one manuscript by hand. But no one, of course, is willing to do that because that's a tremendous amount of work. But getting back to Bruno, I don't see in any of these manuscripts, for example, which are all very ancient and very important, I don't see any of them that agrees with Bruno that Deus should be made longer. Even on accident. Not even on accident do they agree with Bruno. And we see also, uh, Deus, for example, in, in a lot of the manuscripts was actually Domine. Some of them it's still Deus, but a lot of them was actually Domine. And they just don't agree with what he claims they show. He's wrong. He's wrong in what he says. Because the manuscripts do not support what he says. Even on accident. But usually what a semiologist will say is, well, let's toss out all the other 10,000 manuscripts that don't agree, and let's focus on the one or two manuscripts that do agree. And I would submit to you, or I would offer up to you to think about whether that makes sense. Now, Bruno made that top note of Deus two or three times as long as the others. And he also adds extra notes that the manuscripts don't support because he's trying to imitate Muslim singing, okay? Because he thinks that the Muslim religion is very old, um, which it is, but he seems not to realize that the Christian religion is even older. But in any event, why do none of the ancient manuscript support this making that note three, three times as long or two times as long? Why do they not support that even on accident? Even if you say, well, Bruno made it way too long, it's just a nuance, um, you know, it shouldn't be made that long. Well, okay, but even on accident, how come none of the manuscripts reproduce that note, even by accident? Now, Bruno also claims that his elongation of that note is, quote, legitimized by the nooms, and, quote, is a more dynamic way of making the word deus heard. And then he says, since that's the point, right? Wow, he says, since that's the point, okay? Let's talk about that. First of all, if 30,000 people listened to what he's saying, would any of them say that Deus is more dynamic? Or would some of them perhaps say that he's saying it really slow and boring and he destroyed the phrase? Which is more likely in your view? And why is Deus the point? Remember how Bruto says Deus is the point, so we have to elongate it. Uh, in so many early manuscripts, it's not even Deus, it's Dominus, which is a dactyl. Um, but Bruno already admitted that these same notes are used all the time in mode 5. So 
whatever the word is, should we make it more dynamic? And, and this is to show once you start down this, this road, it's a very problematic road. It's a very problematic road. In my view, it's better to simply stick to the manuscript tradition and sing as the manuscripts show us. I, I disagree with him here, obviously. Now, Bruno claims that the accepted performance is an arbitrary habit. Those are his words. Arbitrary habit. Only 100 years old. Which is false, by the way, but that's what he claims. And he claims that his method is a thousand years old. But we have already seen that even if we grant that the Episema, in some of the manuscripts, made the note longer, whereas, as I've already mentioned, I don't, th I, I, I don't think that's right. I think it was probably a barely perceptible nuance, personally. I think it was a very subtle nuance. But even if we support that the Episema, in some of the manuscripts, made that note longer, it's simply not supported by the vast majority of manuscripts, even by accident. And I suppose Bruno would say, well, you know, toss out all the other 10,000 manuscripts and keep the manuscripts that are really pretty and really clean. But, but again, does that make sense, my friends? Does that make sense? Now, when the Editio Vaticana was published under Pope Pius X, you're probably aware already that, that uh, Dom Potier was the president of the commission the Pontifical Commission that produced the Editio Vaticana. The Curiale came out in 1905, the Graduale came out in 1908, the Antiphonale came out in 1912, and there were some other parts that came out along with it as well. Um, but Dom, Dom Potier was the president, and one of his allies was someone named Peter Wagner, who founded a Gregorian uh, school in Fribourg, and was a very famous musicologist, and wrote some excellent books, by the way. Well, when the Editio Vaticana was published in 1908, at the front of the book was a long preface, written in Latin. Uh, some people believe that Peter Wagner actually wrote the preface. Um, that's according to Angelo de Santi, Father Angelo de Santi, who is not very reliable, but wh whoever wrote it, the Editio Vaticana has a world-famous preface at the beginning, okay? And I've given you part of it in Latin, and I've highlighted it with yellow, as you can see. Let me tell you what it actually says in English, okay? This is the preface of the Editio Vaticana, the official, still the official edition of the church. It says, Therefore, when dealing with the manuscripts, one must always remember this. The fact that a manuscript might be older does not mean it must be accepted by reason of its age alone. The restoration of the church's song must not be based on paleography alone but also must take into account history and the art of music, and especially chant, and experience in the laws of the sacred liturgy. Otherwise, even though it might be archaeologically correct, it might lack consistency or offend against Catholic tradition by preventing certain periods from contributing to the heritage of the church, that which is good or even excellent. No one can possibly limit what we call the Gregorian tradition, to a fixed period of time. So this is just to show that Bruno's error is nothing new. And, you know, somebody, I guess, could turn around and they could say, well, you know, if that's the case, then you could go to, you know, the 17th century, which everyone admits was a horrible, horrible time for Gregorian chant. And they could say, you could elevate the 17th century as the, as the pinnacle of chant, and you could take all your manuscripts from, from that time. I guess you could, and I guess I don't really have an, an answer to that, although no one, no sane person that I know of would ever consider the 17th century the height of Gregorian chant. But this is just to show that Bruno's error is nothing new. It was addressed by the pontifical preface at the beginning of the Editio Vaticana. Later on in the talk, we will mention Dom Mokoro and some of what he did to the official edition and how he, he, he found one or two particular manuscripts which he liked better than any others and he ignored all the other 10,000 manuscripts and he favored one or two or three manuscripts because he liked them. And you have to understand, this was at a time when uh, many discoveries were happening. Um, Dom Mokoro fought in the Franco-Prussian War as, as a young man, he was injured in the Franco-Prussian War, I think around 1870 AD, if memory serves. But this was a time that was many, many uh, exciting uh, discoveries were being made. And especially with manuscript study and so forth. 
Um, we could talk a great deal about that and, and the influence that had on some of the people involved in reforming the liturgy and some of the mistakes they made. But the point is, okay, some of these manuscripts were absolutely gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous, absolutely ancient, and the people could not help themselves. They fell in love with them. A on the screen, you can see um, the Jalone Sacramentary, which is a copy of the Gelasian Sacramentary, um, and it's a very, very old document and as you can see it's absolutely gorgeous it's clean it's easy to read and the, do you see how the letters are painted as little animals that's a that's a letter q and the q it looks like some kind of bird or a i don't even know what kind of bird that is but the, the point is the manuscript is colorful and beautiful and gorgeous and we saw that with, with the reformers at the vatican council they had fallen in love with particular manuscripts and they tossed out the rest of the history of the church and the rest of the, the rest of the manuscripts and the rest of the tradition because they loved certain manuscripts so much. And so Don Mokuro really couldn't help himself and it's not difficult to sympathize with such an attitude because some of the manuscripts, and we can see them online, I mean Bamberg, some of the San Gaul manuscripts are so beautiful and so clean that it's, it's hard not to just forget about all the other 10,000 and just prioritize those manuscripts. So uh, I don't blame Don Mokoro for just falling in love with one or two or three of them and just making those uh, count, count too much. Now let's listen to how a semiologist conducts the piece which is called Tibi Dixit Cormeum. <laughs> On the screen, you can see four examples of ancient manuscripts, and we see that the interpretation, which we just heard, doesn't match any of them, and in fact contradicts them. But we are told that we're supposed to just toss out all the other 10,000 manuscripts. Just forget about them. We are told that all the other 10,000 manuscripts forgot the true rhythm, although somehow they transmitted the notes perfectly but they forgot the true rhythm. And not even by accident did they ever reveal the Romanian signs to be anything more than slight nuances. So that's what we're told. And you can see that I don't agree with that. And, and you can think about that for yourself, whether it makes sense to get rid of all the other 10,000 manuscripts and, and try to interpret only one or two or three of them and see if that makes any sense at all. There's a website which is run by Father Anthony Ruff, who is a student of Franz Karl Prossel. Uh, Franz Karl Prossel is associated with the Graduale Novum, basically a semiological uh, version of the Graduale. In any event, you can go to a website uh, which is run by Father Anthony Ruff, and on that website you will see that Father Anthony Ruff is described as a renowned expert. It's a study chant online at your own pace with renowned expert Father Anthony Ruff. So that's his website, and that's what it says about him. But let's listen to a recording that he put up online. He's a, uh, someone who considers himself a leader of the semiological interpretation. So let's listen to something he put online on his website. By this point, you've probably noticed that in general, the semiologists try to match the way that certain neumes, adiastomatic neumes, were drawn. So if it's a diamond note or a tiny little note with the pen, they try to pretend or guess that that may have been sung shorter 
or something like that. And that's what we heard in TB Seat, and that's what we heard in the Father Anthony Ruff recording. And, and this is nothing new. This is, as a matter of fact, I had the great grace to work with Cardine's boss, who, by the way, didn't agree with Cardine, but um, Cardine's boss called the semiology neomentralism. Neomentralism. And if, as you can see on the screen, if you look at the old mentralism, which, by the way, the old mentralism never claimed to be an exact note for note. They give you faster notes and slower notes, but they say that it's not supposed to be um, like metrically perfect, like a metronome or whatever. But in any event, you can see what they did. They had, you know, the diamond notes, the smaller notes were, were meant to be sung faster, and then a note with a tail. Uh, they, they guessed or pretended or supposed that that would have been uh, sung longer as it is in polyphonic music, okay? And so this is nothing new. It's the kind of the semiology theory that, that however the notes look with the pen, that's how we should try to sing them, okay? I've, I'm not aware of any medieval theorist who ever said that. I'm not aware of any medieval theorist who, who made that claim. But that's what they believe. And it's, in a certain sense, it's logical, right? Because if the pen made a, a tiny little uh, uh, dot or punctum, then maybe we should try to do that with our voice, right? We should try to sing that really short or something like that, okay? The, the problem, of course, is that it's a false logic. The same thing would be true if you look at the English language, for example. The word through, the word strophe, the word a, the word go, the word do, the word is, the word strengths, the word screeched, the word dog. Following a type of logic, you could say, you could, you could pretend that all of those were a different amount of syllables. You could say that, you know, through should be, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, through should be seven times as long as a. And you could say that the word strengths, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You could, some might say, well, strength should be nine times as long as the word a, and it's a nine syllable word. And it should be about, you know, whatever, six times as long as the word go and about twice as long as the word dog. And you could say that, and you could say that there's a certain amount of logic to that, okay? But language doesn't work that way. We can wish that it, that it did, but it doesn't. We could say it makes no sense to have, you know, screeched be a one syllable word. That makes no sense. And you can say that it's a free country. You can say that makes no sense, but it is a one syllable word. That's just how it is. Language, when you learn, when you study language, you learn that usage rules. It's not what you think should be done. It's what was done. When you study Latin, for example, with a great teacher, he'll explain. It's not up to you to make up the rules. Usage rules. Whatever they did, whatever they said, that is what rules. It's not up to you to make up your own logic. All through this talk, I have been giving you my take on things, my ideas, and you are free to dismiss them, or ridicule them, or accept them. You are free to do with my ideas whatever you wish to do. Uh, but I would say that there's one thing that I'm, I'm not aware that any semiologist has ever confronted, okay? And that is basically that all scholars admit that there are multiple ways to write a neum. And as a matter of fact, many of those signs pointed to going up or going down. Because remember, with a diastematic notation, it was it was only it was a new, it was a, like a mnemonic device. It was only good for people who already had the mem the the melody memorized. It was only good for people who already knew the melody by heart. And so a lot of the symbols were telling the singer to go up or to go down. And of course, we don't need those anymore. Those are superfluous. They are superfluous at this point because we have diastematic notation. And I understand that they may have been very beautiful and it's amazing what they did, but they are no longer needed because we have diastematic notation. So we don't need symbols, for example, that tell you to go up or down. And that is part of the explanation for why neumes were often written differently. They were written differently in different monasteries. Each monk had his own handwriting, his own particular way of writing. Sometimes, you know, you would have a monk who started a manuscript and then another monk would he, he, that monk would die, so another monk would finish it for him. There are many ways to write an identical noom. And this is a reality I've never, or at least I'm not aware of any semiologist who has addressed this issue. Um, 
And it's only natural with, with language, if you think of music as a language, it's only natural that all these people who couldn't write down notes and were trying to create mnemonic devices to remember melodies that they already knew by heart, it's only natural that different formations would be created for identical notes, in other words, identical pitches, in other words, identical melodies, in other words, identical neumes. Cardin's boss used to question the semiologists because they would always say, well, the, you know, this over here, this one was written slightly different, and then over here he lifted his pen, and why didn't he lift his pen over here? It must have meant something. It's a, it must have meant something. And Cardin's boss would say, <laughs> you know, maybe it meant his hand was tired. And, and that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of where we're at on that. And, and in English, too, we have the same thing. We have the word weather, which is pronounced exactly as weather. Eight, which is pronounced exactly as eight. Air, which is pronounced exactly as air. Bored, which is pronounced exactly as bored. And so forth and so on. And someone could say, well, that doesn't make much sense. You know, they, they, they should have... It doesn't. It's not right that you can have two words that sound exactly the same but have different meanings. Well, okay, I don't necessarily disagree with that. But that's not how language works. And so... We have different ways of writing the neumes in the ancient manuscripts. That's only natural. That's to be expected. It doesn't mean that they were sung differently or they had different notes. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but it certainly seems that Dom Mokoro never forgave Abbot Potier uh, because Dom Mokoro's masterpiece, the 1903 Liber Usualis, was not chosen for the official edition. And it seems, again, I don't, I don't know this for a fact, but it seems to me, that he never forgave Dom Potier for that. He had wanted, it seems at least, he had wanted the 1903 edition of the Liber Usualis, which had his variants in it. He had wanted that to be adopted by Pius X for the official edition. And there's a w long story about why that didn't happen. They started out trying to use parts of it, but Dom Mokoro was so intransigent, and there were so many problems and fights and, and, and backbiting and, and, and schemes and all these different things, it just didn't work out. So in the end, they ended up using Abbot Potier's uh, version from 1883, which was revised slightly in 1895. And again, I don't know this for a fact, but it seems that Dom Mokoro never forgave Abbot Potier for that because he had wanted his book, his masterpiece, his great, the, the results of all of his studies to be used for the official edition. And it wasn't. The, 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 there's a lot more that we could get into, but we're not going to because we're out of time. But I would simply say um, Mokoro almost got his revenge. It seems he almost got his revenge because he, he revamped the official edition. He, he modified it. He changed it. And this is a real difficulty because the church has never technically allowed the, anyone, anyone to change the official edition. And you can actually read, if you pause the video, you can read all these quotes from 1910, from 1958, from 1906, and so forth and so on. And you can read all those quotes, and you can see that the church has never really permitted the signs of Dom Mokoro. And it was a big scandal, and it was a big fight uh, years ago, okay? But, but whatever you do, don't overlook, for example, the 1958 document under Pius XII. It says, the signs, called Rhythmica, which have been privately introduced into Gregorian chant, are permitted provided that the force and meaning of the notes found in the Vatican books of liturgical chant are preserved. So again, you can pause the video and read all these quotes if you, if you wish, okay? They basically mean that the official edition is a rhythmical edition, and that rhythm is to be followed by everyone. And it's still the official edition of the church, even now in 2022. So what did Dom Mokoro do? Well, in essence, he added lengthenings where they don't belong, and he took away lengthenings where they do belong, okay? So, for example, in Gloria 10, Dom Mokoro added elongations where there are none. So he added a pause after quonium. Quonium tu solus sanctus. But the official edition has no pause there. It just goes, Quonium tu solus sanctus. Something like that. I'm not saying it was perfect, but it's something like that. And he also, Dom Mokoro also deleted elongations where they should be. So, for example, the, the official edition, uh, as we dealt with in another talk, which we're not, we're not including that in, in, in this talk, but we dealt, we spent a whole presentation talking about how to read the official edition and so forth and so on. And if, 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 a, mel if a melisma has spaces in it, if a melisma has spaces in it, notice if I say a melisma, if a melisma has spaces in it, equal or wider than a note head, you're supposed to have a small pause. So, for example, the Yitzhu of 1908, you can see it right there. It should go, uh, 
You can see that Father Matthias, for example, uh, follows the official edition exactly as he should. And I can try to sing this for you. I'm not going to say it's going to be perfect, but here it is. It's Father Matthias follows the official rhythm. So it's like... Um. But then you can see that Domokuro ignores those pauses and he wants it to be sung um. again we're not going to go into the talk about the official edition rhythm because that was an entire presentation uh we might put that online and you can read all about it but in general domokuro favors the last syllable because that's kind of like French, where the accent is kind of on the last syllable of the words. So in Gloria 9, for example, the official edition has Laudamus te, benedicimus te, adoramus te, glorificamus te. But Dom Mocoreau, because he likes the last syllable of the word, changed it to Laudamus te, benedicimus te, adoramus te. He didn't do it there for some reason. Glorificamus te. Yeah, so that's, he got his revenge on Abbot Potier because he really caused unbelievable confusion with his, with his additions, which were very controversial. And which, yeah, we're not going to get into the whole story, but they were, they caused big problems. And one of the reasons they were so popular is because when you have those rhythmic signs, you can print the book a lot smaller. And so you can have a tiny book that doesn't weigh very much. Whereas the official edition, because it has those white notes or those pauses or those spaces, however you want to describe them, it has to be a large book. And people prefer not to hold a large book. They would prefer to hold a tiny book, which is very light and easy to hold. And so whether we like it or not, the Salem editions took off and were, they just took over. I have already said that we're not going to go into um, the whole presentation which was given on uh, how to read the official edition, okay? Um, but just to follow up with what I mentioned earlier, you almost had a German-Belgium school and then you almost had a French-English school. Um, and as I mentioned, it, it may be because, partially because Potier uh, took refuge in Belgium, whereas Mokoro took refuge in England. But in any event, the Aditya Vaticana doesn't give you the rhythm. It, it leaves that up to the choir master, to, you know, so there can be some nuance and some freedom, okay? So the first example at the top, it doesn't tell you which notes should be long. So all of the Belgium and Germany editions will sing it like this, as you can see by by the example given, okay? I could have given many examples, but this one will have to do, okay? Any German edition will sing Patrem omnipotentem Factorem celi etere and so forth. Whereas the French, they like that, that ending syllable. They like to accent that ending syllable. So the French edition has Patrem omnipotentem, factorem celi et terre, and so forth. And it, it really, yeah, it, it caused a lot of problems. <laughs> Salam, of course, uh, say that they don't, they, don't, uh, they don't alter the traditional notation in any way. They claim that their uh, rhythmic signs are absolutely harmless and in full conformity with the Aditya Vaticana. In the book by Pierre Kuhn, there's a quote by one of the biggest uh, Salem supporters, Father Angelo de Santi, and he says, The Salem editions with the rhythmical indications have nothing to fear, for they do not alter the traditional notation in any way, as it is found in the Vatican editions, and they contain the strictly Gregorian traditions taken from the very best manuscripts. Wow. Taken from the very best manuscripts. We've already seen that they really only take it from two or three manuscripts, which often, by the way, contradict one another. And it's funny the way they get out of those contradictions, by the way. If one has what they consider to be a long note, and the other one has n does not have a long note, they say, well, no, this is not a contradiction. They say, 
The only contradiction would be if the other manuscript had, for example, a little C. C stands for celeriter, which means go quickly. And they say that would be a contradiction, but simply not having the long mark doesn't mean a contradiction, which in my view, from my perspective, is bonkers, okay? But in any event, notice how they say that there's no, there's no change to the rhythm of the Dezi Vaticana at all. It does not alter the traditional notation in any way. And it says that the only thing we add is taken from the very best manuscripts. And as we've seen, it's only two or three manuscripts, and they ignore all the other 10,000 manuscripts. But so where does that leave us? I can only say that as a choir director, as someone who directs choirs of people, singers, many singers, whether we have in my choral program like 40, 45 people, or, you know, we also have the congregational sing vespers, for example. On, on every Sunday afternoon, we have the full congregation singing. So whether you're teaching real people, I'm not talking about one or two or three people. I'm talking about choirs and congregations. In those circumstances, I have no doubt, no question about the fact that the Salem markings, which are not technically allowed, make the chant very heavy and very slow and very difficult for people to sing. That is what I have found teaching chant to real people, real congregations, real choirs, real singers all these years. I have found that whether it's right or wrong, it slows down the chant. And people would say, well, they're not doing it right. They're, they're, you know, it should only be the slightest nuance and this and that. All I can say is good luck explaining that to a congregation, okay? So for example, this is from Vespers. On the screen, you can see something from Vespers, okay? Uh, let me try to sing it the way that the official edition has it, and then I'll try to sing it according to Dom Mokoro. Spiritus Domini, replevit orbem terrarum, Alleluia. Convitebo tibi Domine in toto corde meo, in concilio justorum et congregatione. Spiritus Domini, replevit orbem terrarum, Alleluia. So that's done according to the official edition, which I find quite beautiful. I'm not saying that I sang it perfectly, I'm just saying I think it's quite beautiful. Now let's look at Salem, and this is how this is always sung. I've been at this for 20 plus years, and I've always followed Mokoro, and I've tried to get people to not hold certain elongations and so forth, but this is the way it actually comes out. Spiritus Domini, replevit orbem terrarum, Alleluia. Convitebo tibi Domine in toto corde meo, in concilio justorum et congregatione. Spiritus Domini, replevit orbem terrarum, Alleluia. As a matter of fact, congregations will elongate those held notes by Dom Mokoro even longer than I did. That's how they will do it. They will make them very long, very slow, and very heavy. And, and the question is, was it really worth it for Dom Mokoro to change this all? And you have to understand, not only, we, we've shown during this talk that they only take two or three manuscripts and, and they, they, they guess or, or interpret or estimate how things may have been sung or may have been done back, you know, in those centuries or whatever. And then they take those guesses and they, and they apply them to the official edition. And they ignore the other 10,000 witnesses that never did that, even by mistake. But here's the thing. Often they're doing this on pieces. They're adding these rhythmic... Don Mokoro is adding these rhythmic markings on pieces which are not even in the ancient manuscripts. Many of the antiphons in the Antiphonale and Vesperale were written in the 18th century or 19th century. Many of the, of the chants in the feast days whether it's Christ the King or whether it's um, the Feast of the Sacred Heart, were written in the 19th century or 20th century. Many of the chants are adaptations. There are, there are many, many chants to which Dom Mokoro applies these 
rhythmic markings, which in my view, he shouldn't be adding in the first place, but, but that, that, that they don't come from the ancient manuscripts. And well, he says, well, but I've studied the ancient manuscripts so well that I know what they would have done for such and such a part. Even though they're not in the ancient manuscripts, I know with these melodies or these patterns or these particular places, I know what they would have done, so I'm going to put them in anyway. And it's, it's just, was this really worth it? It caused so much damage to the chant and so much disruption. Was it really worth it? Here's something Abbot Potier, uh, president of the Pontifical Commission, wrote. And of course, Abbot Potier was the president and others were on the commission of Pius X, but he was the president of the commission. And he wrote in a letter, this was a letter to the organist, Charles-Marie Vidor. He said, the rhythmic signs of Dom Bocaro constitute a grave alteration of the notations, inasmuch as these supplementary signs have nothing traditional about them, and that they have not even an exact relation with the famous Romanus signs of St. Gaul, a reproduction of which they claim to be. Even if they were faithfully reproduced, these latter rhythmic signs, belonging to a particular school, have no legal right to force themselves on the universal practice as it is intended by the typical and official edition. Wow. Who could say it better than Dom Potier? And Peter Wagner called the rhythmic signs an untraditional garment draped over the melodies. So this is not something that I discovered or, or anything like that. This was known, this was talked about, and it's very difficult for me to understand why Domokuro would do such a thing as he did. Because Domokuro was, as we have already seen, contradicting the Vatican rhythm, adding elongations where they don't belong, and taking away elongations where they do belong, it was often very difficult for him to, to place his markings into the official edition. Uh, you could see that with Kyrie V, for example. Um, if you start with the official edition, the official edition be, uh, is supposed to be sung and is clearly and correctly marked by the Belgian school uh, it, it, on the bottom there. It go, it, it, you can see it marked official edition in red, so that's what I'm singing from. Or I could sing from the top because I know how to read the official edition. But Whichever one you follow, this is how it's supposed to go. Kyrie. But as you can see, Domokuro came in and changed the official rhythm. Kyrie. And it's a real question. Was it worth it? Was it worth it? Especially when we consider that the Kyriale is not even the oldest part of our chants. Anyway, I could go on and on and on, but boy, wow. Taking two or three manuscripts and forgetting about all the other 10,000 and causing all this harm and all this disruption, for what purpose? For what reason? I have sung from the Domokro editions for 25 years or so. Uh, I love Gregorian chant, and I have nothing against Domokro in the sense that I've sung from his editions for more than 20 years. I would say, however, that when you try to teach Gregorian chant to a congregation, there is no question in my mind that these alterations that he made to the official edition are a serious, serious hindrance because they cause the chant to become slow and it's, it's, it's really very problematic. And I, I, if someone wants to change to the official edition and get rid of Domokuro, there's no question that it's going to be difficult because once you learn a piece a certain way, it's not easy to change. So for example, this um, Kyrie 10, for example, I grew up my entire life listening to it this way. Kyrie And it's very difficult to change once you have learned something and sung it that way for such a long time. But as I've already said, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced, especially with the Vesperale, that these Omokuro markings cause serious harm and make the chant very plodding and slow and funeral-like and not flowing and not beautiful. And so we'll see where, where all this goes.